morning, everyone. My name is Chris Mullins, and I'm with CapEx Sales. I am joined by my colleague, Matt Matheny. Uh, Russ is on vacation this week, enjoying time with his family. This week, uh, Matt is going to talk to us about the top 10 leak location best practices. Uh, Matt has an extensive background with leak testing. Uh, he spent some time with Infocon prior to coming to CapEx Sales and working with us with uh, Cincinnati Test Systems. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you, Matt, with us. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Just to uh, let you know, a little reminder of what we do and who we are. Uh, we represent some wonderful uh, and very um, high level uh, manufacturers, uh, starting off with ATC Automation. They're based in Cookville, Tennessee. Over 85% of our business comes from customers that come back uh, year after year. They're satisfied with the uh, quality of the uh, installations and the design and build that we do for them. Uh, Cincinnati Test Systems, based in Harrison, Ohio, just outside Cincinnati. They're the largest leak test company in the world. They can provide everything from soup to nuts. It comes leak standards, seals, uh, standard leak test instrumentation, as well as uh, complex custom uh, test solutions and functional testing. Duquesne, plastic joining. Uh, if you need to put plastic materials together. Duquesne is an expert. They've got a wide range of joining technologies from laser to ultrasonic to uh, infrared and hot gas and a variety of other things in between. Symmetric, uh, based in Ottawa, Ontario. Uh, it, they are a leader in high-speed in-process test and data management. So if you need to uh, collect uh, force and uh, distance measurements or torque to turn measurements or anything like that in your process, uh, Symmetric can help. Keller Technologies based in Fort Mill, South Carolina has a comprehensive uh, solutions for industrial air filtration, uh, the, both on the wet and the dry side. Uh, so that's uh, who we are and, and the companies we represent. Let's jump into uh, the, the topic of the day, which is top 10 leak test, leak location uh, best practices. To give you a little bit of perspective, just uh, when we think about leak location, we focus on tracer gas sniffer techniques. And uh, I'm going to let Matt kind of walk us through the principles of operation here. Sure. Yeah, so the first thing you need to do when you are doing leak detection on a part um, via putting tracer gas inside the part is that you need to remove a majority of the air from the part. And we'll get into more detail of why you wanna do that uh, in a later slide. So I'll just uh, put a pin in that. And then we put in the tracer gas and then the operator takes the leak detector probe and passes the probe over any potential leak paths on the part. And it's hard to see in this picture here, uh, this is the typical cart system, but there's a, um, I'm using my cursor to circle the wand. Uh, that, that is what a sniffer probe or wand looks like. Yes, exactly. So you take the, you point the tip of the probe or wand um, along any leak paths, if it's a, a weld or a braze joint or a gasket, uh, or even a casting uh, area of a casting where you might expect some porosity, you would pass the probe over that. And the leak detector, which is sort of that shoebox shaped uh, device on the top of the cart there, will alarm and indicate to the operator that there is a leak. And since you are using a probe, uh, you can actually pinpoint the exact location of that leak. Excellent. Talk to me about sensitivity. What, uh, what kind of leak rates can we detect using this type of technology? So there are different uh, tracer gas leak detectors on the market. Some are made for very small leaks uh, in that 10 to the minus five. So when we say 10 to the minus five, we mean 0 0.00001 cc's per second. So very small leaks. Uh, the, Leaks in that range um, 
typically the applications for that are things like fire extinguishers, uh, refrigerators, air conditioners are tested down in that range. Um, okay. But we can go all the way up into the, you know, 10 cc's a uh, minute and above range for leak location on automotive components, uh, gearboxes, things like that. Very good. And uh, this, this process is operator dependent. Uh, so it is not an automatic process, but generally it's used uh, for locating leak that you've detected with an automatic process, whether it be pressure decay, um, uh, helium hard vac mass spec, you know, something that gives you a pass fail. And now you want to locate the problem with your part. Very good. Let's see here. Okay, what, uh, what is leak location? Um, I'll let you kind of talk through this one as well. Yeah, really just what I just uh, yep. uh, talked uh, upon. You know, if you get a pass fail from another leak detection process, or you just want to use this as your main leak detection process and know where the leak is uh, so you can do something about it. So you, you don't have to throw your part away. Yep. Very good. Okay. And why would you have a leak location process? Yeah. So uh, often it's a complementary process, like I said, to another process. Um, if you can click a couple times there, Chris, I think. Sure. A little... Yeah. You, yep. Even if you can't rework your part, uh, you probably want to do a root cause analysis to know where your quality issue is so it can be addressed. You know, is it in a casting from a supplier? Um, you know, maybe that's a supplier quality visit. If you can rework your part, fix your part, rebraze your part, insert a new gasket, tighten the fitting, you know, you want to know where the leak is uh, easily and quickly so that you can do that rework. Uh, awesome. Obviously eliminate scrap. And uh, I forget what the last one was there. Um, yeah, I think you covered it. Identify yeah, supplier yeah. issues. Perfect. Very good. Yeah. So you don't even need slides. You can just uh, talk through this stuff. I know you know it yeah. very well. <laughs> I've done that well, a let's long jump time. In, yeah. Let's jump into the, the top 10 best practices at number 10, understanding sensitivity range. And we're going to go through each one of these uh, a little deeper dive, just want to cover the topics real quick. Uh, number nine, avoid the pitfalls of bubble testing. At number eight, equipment selection. Number seven, tracer gas selection. Six, speed and distance. And when we talk about speed and distance, we're talking about actually using the sniffer probe uh, to find a leak. Uh, number five, evacuation and tracer gas management. We touched on that at the beginning. We'll take a deeper dive into that. And then controlling the background, uh, we'll explain that. Very, very important when it comes to uh, tracer gas leak location testing. And we'll talk about the use and the importance of calibration and leak standards. Uh, we'll talk about CTS's patented nitrogen purge. It's very unique and uh, another way to locate a leak. And um, at the end of the day, don't do it alone. Connect with an expert. Uh, we're here to help and uh, serve you and, and uh, help make your process better. So with that, we're gonna jump into the next one here. Number 10, understanding sensitivity range. Yeah, so if you want to do a tracer gas leak location process, you really need to understand what size leak range you need to be able to detect with your leak detector. Um, and then that ends up informing your equipment selection, that ends up informing which tracer gas you use, and that um, helps inform what test pressure you're gonna use. So it's a really uh, important first step to know what size leak do I really need to find? Do I have a refrigeration system? If I do, you know, I probably need to be in that minus five range. If I'm right. testing a drive line component, Maybe I'm in a much higher range in that, you know, 1E to uh, the zero power range. Yep. You know, over more towards the right. Oh, this screen. one. Yeah, exactly. So, and we, you mentioned that the sensitivity is in this area. Uh, you know, there's four zeros before the five when we, when we, when we look at this in a normal notation. So that, that's the, the level that we're talking about. Uh, correct. Yeah. Sniffing. 
And if you get much beyond that, um, you can take sniffing with, or, or probe leak detector process into the minus six if you're very, very uh, careful and you absolutely control everything and you use a high test pressure. But really anything beyond that becomes um, practically impossible. Uh, that that furthest left uh, right here red line yeah yep. you really can't do leak location much lower than that unless um, you do something special beyond what we're talking about here so if yeah, you have an application where you do need to do leak location you know below that range certainly talk to us and that's that's a separate discussion yep absolutely all right let's move on to number nine avoid the pitfalls of bubble testing yeah, so if you can click to pull up the... Uh, okay, yep, very good, sorry. Yeah, so bubble testing, there's a couple of different ways that you can do bubble testing uh, that are very common. One is dunk testing, which you're usually charging uh, your part with air pressure or sometimes nitrogen pressure under water, uh, sometimes under oil, and you're looking for bubbles uh, emanating from your part under test. Another form of bubble testing is uh, a soap spray where you've got a bottle of some soapy solution and you spray that on a part. There are some issues with both of these. Um, both of these have the same issue that they have a much uh, lower um, bottom end sensitivity than uh, tracer gas sniffing has. We're talking several orders of magnitude less sensitive. Uh, dunk tanks are often expensive and large and difficult to use. You're uh, relying on an operator to find very small bubbles coming out of the part. Um, you have safety issues with water on the floor. Uh, you now have pet oh, parts that are wet or, um, or oily or soapy that you now have to clean. Uh, and if you look in the automotive industry, more and more parts um, in all systems on the car are getting sensors added to them. And a lot of times these sensors and electronics cannot be um, uh, uh, submerged in water, or squirted with water. So um, there's a lot of reasons you would want to go to a dry process. And in some cases, those parts, those sensors are, are, are sealed components. So it's, there's no handy way to to charge them or compress them with uh, uh, air pressure. The other That's thing, my experience is, um, you know, dunk tanks can become biohazards in a sense that uh, they grow bacteria and they have to be cleaned and maintained um, the, over time as, as you're testing. You, you know, you mentioned oils from the parts and other contaminants from the parts get in the water, makes it murky. And even in, with the best lighting, um, it's very difficult to see all around the part to determine the location of a leak. So, and beyond um, that, you have wastewater issues, and you've got you know your local municipality doesn't want you flushing your gross test tank water down the drain. Yeah, it, you you make a great point, and um, the the one of the other considerations is just the cost of maintaining it uh, as well uh, it can yes. be a real challenge for sure. Very good, awesome. Well, let's go on to number eight. This is equipment selection. Talk to us about the different technologies and, yeah. and different options. Yep. So when you get into a probe leak detector, I'm gonna be careful not to call them all sniffing. Um, we could get into a semantics ar uh, argument here. Sure. But there are leak detectors with probes that have flow that go through the sniffer wand. Um, and that's why they're called a sniffer. They're actually drawing a sample into the leak detector base unit or into the probe of the leak detector uh, to be analyzed. There are other types of probe leak detectors that just have a sensor at the end of the probe. And everything going back to the base unit is just an electrical signal. So those, those solid state sensors that are on leak detectors that aren't really a true sniffer are, are generally less sensitive. So that, depending on your application, can be a good thing or a bad thing. If you're looking for larger leaks in the 10 SCCM range, 100 SCCM range, 
you actually want to use a less sensitive leak detector because if you use something like an Inficon P3000 uh, and you present it a leak signal that big, you're actually going to flood the leak detector. Uh, it's going to go into gross mode and it's going to shut down to protect itself from the sensor getting uh, um, really flooded. So that's where something like the Inficon Sense Sister, um, the green arrow we have there, that's where that technology makes more sense is larger leaks. And then on the flip side, you know, that sense sister technology isn't great for small leaks in the minus five range. So you go to the more sensitive leak detector. So back to that, um, my earlier statement of, you know, what sensitivity do you need? That really informs your tracer gas selection and your equipment selection. Very good. And as you can see, these technologies can go much lower than we can get with pressure decay or bubbles uh, underwater or soap. So um, awesome. it's important to keep that in mind. Yep. All right, good we can uh, move on. All right, coming in at number seven, tracer gas selection. What? Yes. Oh, so, talk to me about that. Yeah, this is always an interesting topic. Um, uh, so the, the two most common tracer gases used are helium and hydrogen. A lot of people think these are used because the molecules are very small. And that's really sort of a myth. The molecule size of your tracer gas ends up not mattering much in the physics of how it's going to come out of a leak. Um, the leaks we're talking about, even with a bunch of zeros after the decimal point, you know, in that minus five range, minus six range, the molecule size is still much smaller than the leak path. So it's actually the, uh, the tracer gases, dynamic viscosity and molecular weight that, um, that drive the flow through the leak. Another common myth here is hydrogen must be a better tracer gas than helium because hydrogen's lower on the periodic table. So that's also a myth. Hydrogen as it exists um, in gas form is actually H2. So it is a barbell molecule that's actually bigger than a helium atom. But again, the size doesn't really matter with the leak rates we're talking about. So that's not what should drive your decision. The decision should be driven off of a few factors. You want to select a gas that's rare in Earth's atmosphere. If you're sniffing for a gas that's a big component of air, like nitrogen, oxygen, even argon, uh, carbon dioxide, especially if you have an operator holding this probe, they're going to be breathing carbon dioxide onto the probe. You don't want to use these gases because they're so abundant in the air in your factory. And your leak detector will not be able to um, have resolution between a small leak and the fluctuations in that background gas. So you need to use something that's rare. And helium and hydrogen are quite rare in Earth's atmosphere. Helium is 5 ppm, parts per million. And hydrogen uh, outside of a factory in your parking lot is something like uh, a half of a ppm. And why did you state it that way, Matt? As far as hydrogen uh, outside in the parking lot ah, versus yeah. maybe so that's in the a factory. really good point so he <laughs> nothing nothing other than a nuclear reaction creates helium so i'm guessing most of our customers don't have a nuclear reactor uh in their factory um but leak detection is done in nuclear facilities so maybe maybe that's an unfair assumption but generally <laughs> in assembly and manufacturing you don't have anything that's going to create helium if there's uh, elevated background of helium in your air, it's because it escaped from um, your testing process. Hydrogen is a little different. If you go sniff the exhaust of a forklift, um, a, a propane forklift, you're going to see a hydrogen spike on a hydrogen leak detector. Uh, if you're processing aluminum, you could see a spike in hydrogen. If you take a hydrogen leak detector, to an aluminum part and actually scratch the surface of the part with the probe, you'll see a little blip in hydrogen. So hydrogen's a little special case where you have to be a little more careful. So that was a good question, okay. Chris. 
Yeah, yeah. And um, another common question that I get is related to this bullet point. Yes. Um, the Hindenburg. You know, is it safe? Talk to yes. us about that. So in almost all applications for hydrogen leak detection, we're using a gas mix that's called forming gas. That's 95% nitrogen and 5% hydrogen. At that concentration of 5% or below, hydrogen can be treated as an inert gas, is non-flammable at that concentration. So that's typically what we do. So that also informs our decision of tracer gas selection because you know, if you stack up helium versus hydrogen at the same pressure, you've got a 20 to one sensitivity difference because with forming gas, we're only counting one out of every 20 molecules that are coming through the leak because we are looking for the hydrogen portion of the gas mix that's most, mostly nitrogen. And, and talk to us, another question that customers commonly ask um, is what is the cost and and can I, can I reclaim it? Uh, what, talk to us about that. The cost of helium especially, but also forming gas is wildly different based upon your uh, geography, your industry, and who your supplier or suppliers are. So what I guide customers on here is there's really no rule of thumb I mean, the best I could say is maybe on average, helium costs uh, about five times more uh, than forming gas, but it varies very, very widely. So when you're looking at this, um, you need to talk to your local gas suppliers and see you know, what the costs are. And the costs vary uh, widely too. If you buy it in a single cylinder, if you buy it in a cradle of cylinders, if you have a bulk tank on site, if you roll up a tube trailer, it's a, it just varies so much that each, each application and customer needs to look at this differently. Um, with helium, the good news is you can do a recovery system and recover 80, 90, sometimes even higher uh, percent of the helium you use and recycle it for further tests. And that is equipment that Cincinnati Test Systems uh, provides and has a lot of experience with. That's so great. there's Good also, stuff. There's also opportunities to detect gas coming out of your part if it's a part that's charged with a gas, like a uh, like refrigerant in a refrigerator or air conditioner or uh, car on a final assembly line. Uh, SF6, if you've got a power distribution system that is charged with that, you can actually sniff for that. And some components are actually charged uh, completely with helium uh, as a shield gas or um, you know, to create a non-explosive environment. Or if you look at fire extinguishers, 5% of the charge inside of a fire extinguisher is helium uh, because it's inert and it can be used as a tracer gas for their leak detection process. So if you look around the, uh, your factory at all of your um, fire extinguishers, each of those has a 5% of that total char pressure charge in there is helium. Excellent. All right, well, let's move on to number six, which is yeah. speed and distance of oh, the leak detector yes. probe. So the let me- The Zorro. Uh... <laughs> so when I walk into a factory where I have not done uh, sniffer training for the operators, I see what I call is the Zorro technique, where someone is just very rapidly and haphazardly passing the probe uh, over or next to the part. And that's not how tracer gas leak detection with a probe works. You need to be very, you need to be slow, methodical, and close to the potential leak path. So uh, general rules of thumb that you'll hear out there is moving the probe at about uh, an inch a second. Or if you've got a braze joint on a refrigeration system, we, we talk about doing two seconds per joint. And you want the probe to be as close to the leak path as possible. Most leak detectors are uh, equipped with a tip on the end of the probe uh, that is replaceable that you can actually drag across your product without marring or scratching your product. So I really teach the operators to go actually touch the probe to the potential leak path and to go slowly and methodically. 
So if I if I'm moving my cursor, if you could see that, is this about the speed that they would go? Yes. Yep. Exactly. Okay. And we can we can convert that to inches per second or minute or what have you uh, as well for more information. All right, great. Let's talk about uh, number five. Oh, I missed one here. Ah, yeah. So actually, if you have if you pick a leak detector model with a higher sniffer flow, you can actually get away with moving the probe faster and with further distance from the leak path. So that's just something to keep in mind. Good deal. All right, number five, evacuation and tracer gas management. This is one of the common things I see that isn't done right when a customer tries to set up one of these processes without uh, expert help. So they'll just jam the tracer gas into the part without doing anything first. You remember earlier I said, there's a reason that you want to evacuate most of the air out of the part. And that's because if you just put tracer gas into a part that already has uh, one atmospheric pressure of air in it, you'll get this effect you see here in figure two on the right, where you are forcing the air somewhere in the part um, and tracer gas is more concentrated towards the end that you're filling through. So if you imagine you have a leak on that air end, and you take the sniffer probe over it, you may have a, a gas coming out that is mostly air or completely air and not your tracer gas. And then your leak detector will not alarm because it is not detecting the tracer gas. So pulling most of the air out with vacuum before you put the tracer gas in, you get that figure three where you're not diluting your tracer gas, you're not forcing air into a pocket, you have a nice even distribution of tracer gas. So no matter where there's a leak, uh, your leak detector can uh, uh, detect the gas coming out. Excellent, excellent. All right, and coming in at number four, I think is probably one of the most important uh, topics we can talk about, oh, controlling yes. the background. Yes. Uh, what, is ba what is background? What do we, when we talk about Yes, it, so... When I walk into a factory, my ears are tuned to the different alarms that different models of leak detector make and uh, leak detectors make. And sometimes I can hear across the factory, just a leak detector sitting there alarming. They're not even running a test on the unit. The reason the leak detector is just sitting there alarming is because there's a very high elevated background of tracer gas in the area. So, you know, you could have a leaking regulator, a leaking uh, valve on your helium cylinder next to the test cell. There's some reason why the background of your helium or hydrogens more than the natural background in the atmosphere. So you're never gonna get below five PPM unless you do some sort of shielding um, with nitrogen or something like that. But you wanna get as close to natural background as you can especially the smaller um, leaks you are trying to find. So if you're in that minus five range of leaks that we talked about earlier, that's common in refrigeration, you are actually looking for a fraction of a PPM rise. So you can imagine if your background is 100 PPM and, and bouncing and unstable, your leak detector is going to have a lot of false alarms. So controlling the background is very important so you can get a good test with no false alarms. And to do this, um, sometimes you need to look at ventilation. You need to eliminate leaks in your testing system and that includes your test connectors. That's very important. Um, the amount of test connectors I see out there that leak um, due to being uh, spec'd wrong or mishandled or not maintained. Um, I see that all the time. Um, mm -hmm. you don't want to use tracer gas for gross leaks. If you have a massive leak that you can feel with your hand or hear from 20 feet away, tracer gas is not for, for that because you're just going to be blowing tracer gas all over your testing area. And the next test you do, your leak detector is just going to be alarming because you've put this tracer gas all through the air. 
Yep. And Excellent. if, if uh, generally speaking, you want to exhaust the tracer gas outside of the building. Otherwise, you're going to be building a cloud at your exhaust point. Very good. Very, very important. Excellent. Let's move on to number three. Calibration yeah. and leak standards. Talk to us about uh, that, those topics. So the good thing with a high quality tracer gas leak detector like you might get from Inficon is that the leak detector's measurements do not generally drift over time, but you still want to do a calibration. And the reason why is it is a really good health check for your leak detector. If your sniffer filter is clogged or something is, is wrong with your leak detector where it's not detecting the tracer gas, the calibration procedure will catch that and then prompt you to you know, figure out why my leak detector cannot calibrate. So unfortunately, I've seen some leak detectors in the field where they've never been calibrated since they've left the factory. And, and that worries me not because you know, the leak detector measurement drifts, like I said, but what if something goes wrong with the leak detector? How do you know it's not detecting tracer gas anymore? So CTS, uh, Cincinnati Test Systems, uh, produce, has their own calibration lab and uh, calibrated leak uh, manufacturing. So any gas, leak rate, um, it, that's something uh, we can help you out with. Awesome. All right, coming in down to the wire here, coming in at yeah. number two, nitrogen purge with purging clamshell. And this is a patented yeah. uh, process that CTS developed uh, a number of years ago and, and has introduced into the marketplace. Talk to us about some of the, the advantages, and I'm just going to go ahead and, and put all the bullet points out so yeah. you can talk Yeah, that'd talk be great. Through. So... This is a really interesting uh, technology because it addresses a couple of the other things in the top 10 that we talked about. We talked about controlling your background. We talked about sensitivity. We talked about equipment selection. So what this purging clamshell allows you to do is to encapsulate your part or a portion of your part, uh, such as that aluminum to copper transition joint there in that picture and actually control the background atmosphere around the part uh, with nitrogen. So you have a nice clean atmosphere that you're gonna be sampling with your leak detector. And then you charge the part with your tracer gas and sample that controlled atmosphere for leakage. So this can help you increase your sensitivity. This can help you eliminate some operator dependency with moving a sniffer probe um, and uh, yeah, control your background. So the, this allows you in certain applications where it makes sense to have a, a much more controlled process. I think we had a redundant slide here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and kind of move through these and um, come up to the last but not least. Yes. Number one, <laughs> the, don't the go it biggest, alone. The biggest uh, thing I see is that uh, a customer thinks they can just do this on their own without any experience. And they end up missing um, somewhere between nine, one and nine of the previous nine things. So the best thing to do is if you're interested in this process or if you're not sure if this process is right for, for your facility or your parts, or um, you're having issues with a process like this, just reach out to us and uh, we, ha we have a lot of experience and usually we can come in and within a couple minutes, you know, identify what the issue is. So um, again, I'm Matt Matheny. I cover Western North Carolina and South Carolina. Yep, and I'm Chris Mullins. I cover uh, Eastern North Carolina and Virginia and we are here to help you. Uh, we thank you for Joining us today, I will um, give a little bit of a plug for next week. We have, Russ will be back and uh, we have a conversation with Shunk. Shunk provides uh, clamping and gripping uh, components and solutions for automation. And we'll have a special guest joining us at 1130 next week. 
As always, if there are some topics you are interested to learn more about and hear, let us know. We'll, uh, if we don't know about it, we'll do the research and find maybe an expert in the field and have them join us and uh, you know, try to help grow all of our uh, experience and knowledge. So uh, we thank you very much for your business. We, we do not exist without you. We're very appreciative. Uh, we're, we're glad to come and help and serve you and improve your, um, your, your processes and, and your quality and, and your business. So thank you very much and have an awesome day. Take care.